Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second session today. Um, we have a lot of practical skills sessions that are going to be happening during the week. Um, and this is our first one this, this week. Um, Bill Himes, which I think if you have not met him already, you definitely will by the end of tonight. Um, Bill is very personable and uh, wants to get to know you, similar to, um, to John and Sarah. Um, Bill was the Territorial Music Secretary here in our territory for a long time, 38 years. That was a long, long time. Anyway, um, but it's great to have Bill here. He teaches beginners band at the Oak Brook Terrace Corps. And um, he's going to share with us some of his expertise. Um, if you've ever, uh, a lot of people at our core would say um, our beginners, by the time they're playing in their first concert, like you wouldn't necessarily even know that they're beginners just because of, um, and I've been able to witness and I substitute for Bill um, for his class as well and just witness um, the Jedi mind tricks he can pull on, um, you know, some of these uh, young kids. and. Um, he'll speak to it, um, I'm sure, but a lot of times uh, Bill's mantra is teach by stealth, and um, uh, hopefully he'll be able to educate us all on that as well. But welcome Bill Himes as he's coming presenting to us. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've just got a few minutes to get all this in, and so <clears throat> I'll just tell you my my outline here. It's talking about, I've been given the topic of starting a brass band, and I've got a few questions, and one is why, and another one is how, and then we're going to talk about a few forms of it. So I'll just get right onto it. You've gotten a couple of pages of handouts there, and uh, you may wonder why any of that has even been printed up for you, but let me just say, <clears throat> I've been asked to talk about starting a brass band. Why would we start a brass band? I mean, we think like this is, isn't this something that William Booth just uh, seized upon in 1865 and now it's hopelessly outdated? And uh, why brass when there are so many other instruments today and we can have praise bands, we could do all these things. So why don't we just give up on that and just, uh, you know, go with the flow, whatever is going contemporary right now. May I just tell you this? that for the last many years, I've been a national judge for the North American Brass Band Association. And they have a big contest. They haven't had it for the last two years because, you know, uh, but um, I've been the judge at those national contests, which are typically held in Fort Wayne and bands come from all over the United States, brass bands. And you cannot imagine the level of proficiency and difficulty uh, that they've reached. And not only that, the multiplicity of these bands, they just keep expanding. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to go down to Chattanooga, Tennessee, because there are like four or five brass bands in the area, and they just wanted to work with a clinician who was fairly experienced. Chattanooga, Tennessee, you got to be kidding me. Do you know where the finest brass band is in this country, like national champion? Kansas City, Missouri, Fountain City Brass. And years ago, 20, 25 years ago, when this movement was just getting started, they used to bring in staff bands, like the Chicago staff band. We did a concert, a gala concert one night. They, they had uh, the uh, Southern Territorial Band. They've had the New York staff band, Canadian staff band, all these bands in to show them what a brass band could really sound like. Now, I don't think any of us would qualify maybe the international staff band, because these bands are playing so far beyond us technically. Now, I'm not here to talk about, so we should be learning our 30-second notes or anything like that. What I'm saying is the rest of the world has discovered what a fun thing a brass band is, because we get all the clarinet parts now. We get all the violin parts. We get all the hard stuff. When you're playing in a, uh, in a concert band or an orchestra, typically the brass is the muscle. Okay, we're getting up to forte. We better bring in some guts now. Okay, trombones and trumpets and horns you can let loose. But in a brass band, we get to do everything. So that's just in the world of brass in general. But I wanted to hit on uh, why I think it's important uh, in the Salvation Army. 
For one thing, and I think Steve Cobb hit on this, a brass band is acoustic. So that means you don't need a lot of fuss. We got mics and chords and all kinds of amplification for the things we're doing here, but a brass band can just sit down and play. That's very practical. Um, a brass band can uh, also, and this is very important, can reach a fairly mature sound more quickly than just about any other instrument I can think of. I was a school music teacher. I taught band and orchestra for five years before the uh, Salvation Army hoodwinked me into coming to Chicago. And I told the Army, I said, I love teaching. That's what I feel called to do. I'll give you three years. Well, it was so fulfilling, it, it turned into 38 years. But the thing that I discovered when people said, well, Bill, do you miss teaching? I said, you know, sometimes I think I do. And then I hear a seventh grade oboe player. And that pretty well does it for me. Or a sixth grade violinist. You know, um, they, it's going to be a while before they sound beautiful. But really, I'm thinking of my own playing as a kid, and I, I don't think I was a prodigy by any means. But by the time I was 10 or 11 years old, I had a pretty good sound on my baritone. It was a pretty good tone. And even my kids, my beginners, that I started uh, October 1st last year, um, I would had each one of them play a test every week. They'd all have to do something on their own, same line. But I'd listen to some of them. And just in a few weeks, I go, you know, you have a really good tone. They could get a sound, a really decent sound, fairly quickly. Now, violinists can play 16th notes much quicker than brass players, but we don't really need the 16th notes too soon in the kind of music we're, we're playing, at least initially. So there's that aspect of it that we can reach a fairly mature sound pretty quickly. So for a core that wants to start a music group, I wouldn't fall into the trap of like, well, you know, let's let all, let's have them play all the instruments they can play in school. Let them play in school. You know, if they want to study the clarinet or something, play in school. Beth, what did you play? Flute? Yeah. Until what, what year? Yeah. And then she discovered the trumpet, you know. But all this year she played, and I'm sure she was good on it, but, you know, it's hard to believe when you hear her play today that she didn't start at eight on that instrument just like everybody else. But, but there we are. Um, I yeah. would say, yes, what? Was that the voice of God there? Um, the brass band um, also is a model of simplicity. I want you to look at that score page that I've given you there. I want you to look first at the concert band side of things. This is two versions of the same tune. This is a song, Worthy as the Lamb by Don Wordson, that the Zondervan people years ago, uh, not 1973, but that's when the copyright of his tune was, but somewhere in the 80s, they asked me if I'd write some music geared for Christian schools for concert bands to play. And they gave me this tune because they owned the copyright. So you can see that it starts out with a little bit of noodling in the flute and the piccolo and the clarinets and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but look all the way down uh, from the top to the bottom there. You'll see a couple of treble clefs and then there's a bass clef for the bassoon. And then you'll see the clarinets all in one clef. You'll see the uh, saxophones in one clef, uh, trumpets, horns, in treble clef, and then we get the bass clef and the baritone, the tuba and that kind of stuff. So first of all, you gotta learn bass clef if you wanna teach this. But let me ask you this, does anyone know their, uh, other than Beth, their flute fingerings for the beginning there? Yeah, huh? music teacher, okay. You might think you know the fingerings for French horn, but let me tell you, they're different. And if you've played clarinet, does that mean you know how to play the saxophone? Oh no, completely diff different set of fingerings. Completely different set of fingerings from the flutes, by the way. And God help you if you want to play the bassoon because your thumbs better be good. The thumbs, each thumb can play seven keys on the bassoon. And you still got all the fingers. There are books this thick of bassoon fingerings. There are so many alternative ways to finger a note. This is why uh, Tom and I went to school 
to study music education so we could learn enough to be dangerous on flute, clarinet, cello. I had to take two semesters of violin, um, percussion, French horn, saxophone. You, you don't become proficient on those things, but you learn to understand how the embouchure works and the fingering system is all that. We now have flute different than oboe, different than bassoon, different than all the clarinets. The clarinets are all the same from top to bottom, fortunately. Saxophones different from certainly trumpets. French horn is different from the other brass. Trombones are in a different clef along with the tubas, all that kind of stuff. Now flip the page. Look at this. This is the same piece of music. You brass players, are there any fingerings you don't know in the tuba part, in the baritone part, in the horn part? One fingering system from top to bottom. The guy that's in charge of our IT for this thing, the head of all IT for the territory, Ron Schultz, was our core bandmaster. His degrees are not in music, they're in IT and computer science. But he was a very effective core bandmaster. He knew when we played wrong notes. He knew what the fingerings were. And being a trombonist, he knew those positions too. And by the way, the positions on the trombone are not that hard to learn, even if you've never played trombone. You know that anything you'd play first valve on your cornet or horn is going to be right at the bell. You know, the ending you play second valve is going to be halfway between that. These positions you can learn and equate, deadly simple. So it doesn't require a bachelor's degree in music education to be a core bandmaster and a darn good one. You don't need that huge input of knowledge that we spent years trying to figure out how all these other instruments work. That's pretty practical, I think. Now we've got some percussion notes and things like that down at the bottom, but even those are not too mysterious really. When you see the little uh, jagged lines on there, you know that they're gonna do a roll. They want some kind of continuous sound, but there's really not too much mystery there. Um, but I just, I bring that to your attention to just show the simplicity of it. Now, the other thing I want you to look at is the clef and how they work. Because in my mind, the purpose of a clef is to distinguish pitches like graph paper, okay? So we got these five lines and when my beginners start, they're starting with that note right there, C, treble clef, okay? But for, um, and then eventually they're gonna get all the way up to, let me put a treble clef so you know what I'm talking about. They're gonna get all the way up to that C there. But when Tom was studying trombone in school, he had to learn bass clef. And that C right there was actually way up here and it's not even a C, it's what we call a B flat. So his tuning note is already off the staff. And when we go up to finally up to say a high G, which is kind of the normal average register uh, for uh, an average player, if they can go from G to G, they pretty well have what they need to play most brass music other than the virtuoso stuff. If, if we equate that with bass clef, Tom's already way off the staff. He's way up there. That's his G or what we call F concert. The clef is useless. And for the tuba and bass clef, that low C is actually way down there. I mean, it, the practicality of a treble clef, which is the way it applies to saxophones, clarinets, and brass band is so functional. It's so useful. And the clef, the staff that we're working on actually does what it's supposed to do. Now, Beth would tell you, cry me a river. I had to play flute and flutes are way off the staff too. When they get, I mean, it's very common for them to play a high F way above high C, and that's, that's well within their wheelhouse. That's going to look like this. One, two, three. It's going to be way up there. I got to draw one that time. But you see what I mean? It's, it's, the clef is useless. 
unless you're a piccolo, in which it sounds an octifier automatically. <laughs> but see how simple this art form is that we have here. And not only um, does it not require a huge amount of music education, it, re it requires some basic stuff, how to produce a tone, the names of the notes, how the rhythms go, that kind of thing. But it's well within the amateur musician, the volunteer musician, feeling fairly comfortable with. Um, I would also say this, the brass band is inclusive and expansive. Okay, some of you come from very small core, you might have a very small ensemble, four or five players. Look at all those chairs up there. That's based on, I guess, how many brass players there are that are out here playing. If there were 10 more, could they accommodate them? Yeah. You can add more parts as long as it's proportionate. You don't want to have 40 cornets and two horns. That's not even fair. But when in our core, somebody comes into town, what do you play? I play the baritone. We'll find you a baritone. We can, we can add another chair. It's not, it's not bad. At our core, we also have a praise band and a youth praise band. Can they have as many people as those chairs up there in a praise band? I want to tell you that, in my opinion, anything past seven in a praise band is mud. I haven't heard any groups bigger than that be very effective. Partly because they're amplified, for one thing, and the other thing is they just don't need more players. It's just going to add to the mess. And when they keep it down to rhythm guitar, lead guitar, bass guitar, drums, you know, whatever they're, they're doing that way, that's fine. And with some vocals. But you get beyond seven, you got mud. So how inclusive is that? Now, I'm not saying, well, we ought to get rid of the praise band because they're just too darn exclusive. No, they're not being exclusive. They're being real. That's, that's what it takes. You can't really tolerate much more than that. Uh, if, if people are going to hear themselves sing on, on a Sunday morning, being a company. And our praise bands do a great job in our core. And they really do fit in. They really do their best. And if you say, this is the theme of the service, we need some songs to fit that, they'll fit the theme. It's not like, well, we, we don't know those songs or we got some other songs we want to sing. I mean, they're in the flow of ministry along with us. But there are limits to that size. And if we want to include people, uh, as I think we can do, I think that's one of the pluses of a, of a brass band. Um, brass band's also very versatile. I think Steve Cobb might have spoken to that and play in a lot of different styles. I mean, there's nothing like a band playing a march. I was out in Colorado a week, two weeks ago at a concert uh, that the, the uh, National Repertory Orchestra played, and they play a very pops concert, really fine players from all over the United States in this, in this or symphony orchestra. They played the Stars and Stripes Forever, and it was okay. But when you hear a band do it, it's got punch, it's got drive, it's, it's a whole different thing. A band sounds great with band music, but they can also sound pretty good with orchestral music as well. We do a lot of transcriptions that way. We can play in a jazz style. We can play in a rock style. We can play all kinds of things. Now, is, is it going to be as convincing as a rock band? No. Is it going to be as convincing as a big band? No. But we can really change the tenor and style of our, of our sound much easier than some of these other groups. It's very versatile. And in contemporary Christian music, we sing in a lot of different styles, as you heard uh, Jude, when he, he led us today, we sang a very traditional, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then we sang some contemporary songs. It, it was all well and good. We could do that. A brass band can also adjust to that idiom uh, very quickly. Hence, um, our need for hallelujah choruses. The whole reason we did that and started that series years ago, two things. One was so that brass bands could play what people wanted to sing. There were a lot of new contemporary songs, still are, a lot of songs coming out at, that um, bands just didn't have the music for. So at least we picked 10 every year and just kept adding to it. Now they're working on 301 to 310. 
That's how many hallelujah choruses we have. And it's a mix of those contemporary tunes and also some older tunes uh, that get a little bit of juice when a brass band takes over. Um, thinking of Marty's arrangement of Holy, 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 which gets a lot of use. That song that we sang today, and when you hear it in that brass setting that he and Pete McBride did and Steve Wheeler, it really resonates. Or Storm the Forts of Darkness or Onward Christian Soldiers, the Macris version. It takes an old tune uh, and gives it new life. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why we do that series. And we can do it because a brass band is flexible, can play in a lot of different idioms. Not only that, uh, we can play indoors, we can play outdoors. Tom was with me uh, at the height of COVID when it first hit and everyone just literally hunkered down. We didn't go out of our houses hardly. And I put a, a notice in the mailboxes of the, 20 or 30 houses on my block in Elmhurst, Illinois. And I said, next Sunday at one o'clock, a brass ensemble is going to be in my front yard playing hymns from a social distance. I said, if you'd like to come out and bring your chairs out on your boulevard and distance yourself any way you, you feel safe. And here's my cell phone number. If you have a favorite hymn, just text me. And our little quintet, without any rehearsal, with five of us came out, sat down on my front lawn, and 80 people joined us on the block. And they still talk about it. We could do that. We didn't have to plug in anything. We didn't need any sonic deflectors. We could just sit on my front lawn and play beautiful music. And I'll tell you, you know, what I heard from my neighbors was, thanks for doing it as well with my soul. I needed to hear that today. Our music can still reach and, uh, and touch people. Now, I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I just want to reinforce these thoughts um, to, for you to go home and say, yeah, you know, there is really continued reason for us to persist in this idiom. It's functional, it's accessible, uh, we can do this. Um, I would also say turning it inward that it's a small group ministry, not just to the people in our core, but it's a small group ministry within ourselves. And I don't mean that in a selfish way, us four and no more, or we're this little clique or that kind of thing. I don't mean that. A small group is large enough to include people, small enough to know their needs and, and their hurts. And this brass band is another example of a small ministry if we handle it right, if we're vigilant, if we understand that, that that concept. There are people in our band, I'm no longer the bandmaster, but there are people I've been keeping track of via email because I know they're hurting, because they're, they're part of the band I play in. I want, the, I want to know how their surgery is going. I want to know how that new job is going. I'm trying to keep in touch not out of any gimmickry or because, oh, we need that player in the band or something like that, because they're part of my small group. They're part of our ministry. And um, I see Dave nodding. Dave had a wonderful end chair solo cornet player in his band, Alan Nelson, and he played in the staff band as well. He retired about the same time I did. Alan developed a cancer that was taking him pretty quickly. And I got a call saying, hey, we're going to play at his bedside in the hospital. You want to come along? Man, I was honored. Went out to Rockford. We had, I don't know, a quintet, sextet, something like that. And uh, at Swedish Hospital, and they let us in to play. And uh, we played all the great hymns. And, and Alan was with us. And it was, it was a wonderful ministry. Why is that? Because he was one of us. He was in our band. He was, you know, we loved Alan and we, we grieved over the disease that he was fighting. And we sang peace, perfect peace, far beyond all understanding. And I drove home and got the word that he was home. He had died. That's a small group ministry. How do I know Alan? Because he played cornet and he was in the band. We have to have, we have to understand that. We have to be small enough to understand the individual needs and to make individuals feel wanted and important. We can do that. There are many times when I was the core bandmaster 
where I stopped and said, okay, I just want the first players to play, the first part players, first cornet, first horn, first trombone, first baritone. Okay, play that, that section we just played there. And the rest of the band had to sit there and listen to it. You know what they heard? They heard like melody and something, but it was empty. And I said, that's why you guys on second parts are important. It just doesn't sound complete without your harmonies, without that fifth there, without that third. Our small group ministry teaches people that they're important even on the, on the humblest of parts. And I would also say this as a composer who has written for two different worlds. I write for the Salvation Army and every now and then I get a chance to write for something like the Black Dyke Band, one of the top bands in the world. They can play anything and they want to. Their third cornet players want to play the 32nd notes of the solo cornet and you can write them for them, it'd be fine. But the genius of Salvation Army music is kind of exemplified when I saw the Flint Citadel Band when I was a kid, they had these flashy, great soloist on solo cornet, and they had my grandpa on second cornet, and he could play the second cornet part. Those parts are, were much easier. We wrote for two bands. We write for two bands. We write for the solo parts. We expect them to get up to high C, but we wouldn't ask the second cornet to do that. So they can sit and play what they know and feel very fulfilled about it. They're filling in the harmonies, they're filling in all the, you know, they're giving us the sound that we need and it's within their ability level. That's the genius of Salvation Army Brass Band, which is quite different than what we call outside uh, brass band. Um, I would also say that music outside of corporate worship, aside from that, provides the best, perhaps the only opportunity for participation experience that is both genders and multi-generational. You know, I've, I had this little chart here I was gonna write out, but I've, I've completely discombobulated it with all this cleft stuff. But you know, we got kids ages, that's the beginners I start, boys and girls. We've got youth and they can be, kids can be sunbeams, they can be boys adventure core, they can be one gender or the other. You got youth, you could be in torchbearers or YPL, both genders, but a certain age group. Um, you can have girl guards. It is what it is, just girls. You can have uh, explorers, is that what we call it now, Scott? So just boys, but in that age group. Um, we've got some things that, that have both, like our YPL or that kind of thing, boys and girls, but a limited age group. We get to older things like home league. Well, we know that's women's, or they don't even call it that now. It's women's fellowship or something like that. We have numerous, in our core, we have something like 20, some, more than 20 small group Bible studies. And they're very demographic. I, I lead one on Monday night for men. It could be all ages, but it's just men. You know, there's a women's one that meets down the hall, separate, and that's good. It's good that it's a separate gender. We can talk about things that just us guys need to reinforce about, that kind of thing. But then you get the music. And my beginners, boys and girls, I start them in third grade, age eight. Get to youth band, it continues. Junior praise band, boys, girls, but in an age group. Then you get to praise band, songsters, senior band, you got both genders and you could have a really wide age in that group. Now, I just wanna ask you this, where else in society, forget the church, where else in society can you have that experience that I have when I sit down in my core band and the guy next to me is like 22, just married, down the line is a 14 year old baritone player, started high school, and me, a 72-year-old guy in the same section, where else in life do I get that experience of hanging out with all these different generations, learning from the young people their uh, vision and energy and creativity, and what they learn from me is wisdom and experience. I can sit next to this kid who's struggling with getting this note and I can say, you know, I've found 
that if you take a breath there rather than there and just play that in one phrase, you'll make it. And the kid does it and he looks at me like, that worked. You know, that's a great experience. That's a multi-generational experience that we don't have hardly at all in life. And only in corporate worship in the church is it that inclusive. And even then, for good reason, we want to give the youngest kids, at least in our, our core, we do this wisely, I think, but there's a certain point where now the kids can exit for junior church because they're starting to itch, you know, and, uh, and they need a potty break or something, but they're on their way. Well, now we have uh, songsters and band, praise band, those things that really expand the age opportunities that we have. That's why I'm so on what we're doing. Simplicity of pulling it off, the practicality of it. And not only that, there's one other thing. When I was a Corps cadet, I loved Corps cadets, and it was back in the day when you had to go six years, not just five, but six. But our Corps cadet guardians were really dedicated to us, and they made sure we did the lesson, and they made sure that we did the project or the essay question, whichever was due. And it was a good experience being in there, but you know, I gotta tell you, I didn't see the immediate benefit of it at the time. I didn't mind going, I didn't mind being part of it. There were some cute girls in the class, added incentive. But uh, it was a while before I realized, you know, um, the last time I studied the Old Testament, it was in a corkadic, upper grade corkadic class. The last time I studied the doctrines of the Salvation Army, or uh, some of our policies, it was in a core cadet class, but it didn't really hit me at the time. It was a long time before I saw the benefit of it. But now think about our music groups. We rehearse in our core, we rehearse on Wednesday night. Songsters get like an hour and 15 minutes, the band gets an hour and 15 minutes. It's, it's not long, but it, it prepares us. And it's weekly when it's not COVID, it's weekly. So we get that time together. And then for our efforts, we see it come to fruition three days later on Sunday. You don't have to wait years to say, oh, now I understand why we did that Old Testament thing. It's like, man, I'm glad we practiced this because Sunday is really a blessing to the people who heard it. There's immediate um, response time. It's a very short time between our effort and our reward, our effort, and the fulfillment, the knowledge that we fulfilled something, that we did something that meant something to the people that heard it. We just played this Sunday without the benefit of rehearsal. But we finished, what was the name of that march, Tom? It was like a march at the end, and it had uh, Falcon Street and a praise you the Lord. Yeah, and, uh, but, you know, the sermon was done, the benediction was given, and we played this postlude, and everyone hung around for it, and it was real stirring. It wasn't like we were 40 strong or anything like that. There might have been 10 of us. I don't know. But there was a spontaneous applause at the end, and it wasn't gratuitous. And so, well, they're done. I better clap. But they really enjoyed it. There was a fulfillment of knowing, like, there was a reason why I sat down and twiddled these valves that Sunday. It actually spoke to someone. We have that opportunity, and I don't mean to limit it just to band, but, but certainly in our music uh, as well. Well, uh, very quickly, let me move on and just say, um, how do we do this? How do we start a band? You're thinking, easy for you to say, Bill. You came from a core where you got this band and youth band and beginners band. When I first started going to that core, our band might have been, we only had one band, it might have been 10, 12 people. It was a small little thing we could fit on one little corner of the platform. But you may say, yeah, but at my core, I got nothing. It's just me. How do I get started? What I would say is this. Try to recruit a kindred spirit, someone who enjoys music along with you. It might start by just doing some fellowship reading sessions, just where you're saying, hey, you want to play some duets? I need to get in shape here, something. You know, just something where you're, you're playing with another person. Duets, quartets, we got all kinds of ensembles. If there's some interest and it takes hold, it's like, yeah, that was, that was kind of fun. What if, what if we created a performance opportunity here? What if we provided special music on a Sunday morning? 
he said to the core officer, hey, we got this trio that we could play. And if there's a time coming up where you think it would work, we're good to go. Well, th that's, a, that's a good way to get things going. Now, I'm not talking about beginners yet. I'm just talking about how do you get something uh, started at your core. If you can create performance opportunities, um, such as I did with uh, hymns from a social distance, we weren't doing anything. I figured, well, we can do this. This is safe. And we got a great response to it. People love it when you're playing on the kettle, even if it's just a solo, but uh, to play, you know, at Christmas time, and we can do it with as few as two or three, you know, so that's a good excuse to get people uh, involved. Hey, I'm going to be on the kettle this Saturday. You want to play with me? I'm going to be on from one to three. You know, I, I've often recruited somebody to, to toot along with me that way. Um, the divisions now with divisional music directors are creating all kinds of performance opportunities at least once a month where they're coming together and they've got these groups that are learning together. Take advantage of that. Bring somebody uh, along with you. Uh, there are community care programs in our core twice a year, Christmas, Easter, uh, we divide into small groups and we play at nursing homes. Um, you know, they're just so grateful. You may think, oh, we sound terrible. They are grateful to hear somebody come out and, and play Silent Night. You know, uh, it doesn't take much to do that, but you create the market, you create the need. Um, but I, I can't say enough about the divisional music programs and music camps and that kind of thing. Um, and then that develops into worship support where you, if you get a, a coterie of people, a group of people, they say, you know, let's, let's just keep at this because uh, next Sunday they need us to accompany the song. Next Sunday they need an offertory. Next Sunday they'd like us to do a prelude to start the meeting. You can get things going on a regular basis. Then you can, that's your um, incentive to rehearse in a regular way. And I think as other people uh, see that, you go, well, you know, I play, can I, can I join? Yeah, come on along. Um, which gets me to beginners, which is my pet little project. Now I've got, I think I've given you this thing, it's page two, it's just two things, um, and, I'll, and I'll get to that. But um, there are four principles I like to follow, actually a few more than that when I'm teaching my beginners. One is I don't do it on my own. <laughs> They asked me to teach beginners, I don't know, 40 years ago in my core, and I said, I'm a music teacher by profession. I know how to teach beginners. But more importantly, I know how to teach people how to teach. So my only demand is that you provide me with at least one person who's willing to be my assistant so I can teach them how to teach. And my daughter was up to start beginner's band. We got to the fall and I said, so who have you got? And they said, we don't have anybody. I said, I'm not teaching. I said, if this core can't come up with one other person who cares, I'm not teaching. So we delayed it for a few months. They found somebody and that person was my assistant. And I can't tell you how many assistants I've had along the way, but what we do is uh, initially, the, the assistant goes around with a pencil and points out the notes as they're going by for the kid who's hoping for the best, and maybe I can just ad lib, and, uh, or like hold your horn up, or you got sticky valves, let me put some valve oil on it. They're, they're jumping around and doing that while I'm teaching uh, the class initially. But then at the end of class, we do the, the thing that you see on the back side of that, which is the instrument class lesson plan. And I say, okay, here's where we are in the book. Here's what, here's what I'm gonna do for the warm up. And I'll put, you know, like line, I didn't have enough paper to give you some examples, but uh, in the photocopy room, but it'd be like something dead easy that I know they know how to play. They can play it in their sleep. That's what we're gonna warm up on, give some confidence. And then we're going to jump to the test. And whatever the test is, is the one I've marked in their book saying, next week, I'm going to hear you on that. And they all get to play one at a time on the test. And then there's stuff where it's like review, things I want to reinforce. And I may put, you know, like how many minutes I'm going to spend on each thing. I don't teach longer than 40 minutes, four zero. Why is that? Anybody? These are eight-year-olds. Let me give you a hint. David? Attention, yeah, they've already had a whole day of school and they've grabbed a quick supper and some of them might've gone to Sunbeams and Boys Adventure Corps before they even got to me 
and now I get them. It's probably their last class of the evening. So I got to be fast paced. I got to be asking them questions, not just talking to them. Keep their mind alive. Okay, who wants to tell me what the finger ring for F is? Yeah, thank you, Rodney, for his valve. You know, that kind of thing. You're always, you're always trying to engage them, kind of the stealth thing that, uh, that Tom's talked about. But for me to be effective as a teacher, what I have to understand is what is it like to be an eight-year-old after a long day sitting in my class? What is it going to take for me to make it interesting for them? And you can be very uh, creative on that score, but so I'll, I'll have the tests, I'll have the things I want to review. I know the new material I want to teach them. Um, I only teach B flat instruments. I only teach cornet or baritone, mostly cornet. I don't teach trombone, I don't teach percussion. Uh, the reason is because everyone wants to play percussion. But the other thing is, when I, I, I say to the kids, no, I want to teach you notes. I want to teach you note names, because as a percussionist, you're going to need that when you get to school. You're going to need to know your mallet stuff. So we're going to teach note names here. And by having all either cornets or baritones, now I have the same notes. So I'm not saying, OK, that's C, G for you, D. A, you know, it's not back and forth, and I can have them recite stuff. So every line they recite in one way or another. Sometimes it's counting, and I count by duration, not location. So if they're doing hot cross buns, they're going to count it one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. When you get to the quarter notes, one, 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 one that way. Because anybody who is had a long day and they don't want to have to think, if you're doing by location, they can go one, two, three, four, one, two, you know, they can count to four, but you don't know if they know. But when they're saying one, two, one, two, one, 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 you know they know. And then I can also transfer that and say, now every time you said one, that's when you use your tongue. It's a very simple concept. So we'll chant things by and in pitch. I don't ask them to sing, but I just sing and they sing along, stealth. Or I'll say, okay, let's do the letters this time. So they'll go E2, D2, C2, 3, 4, that, that kind of way. Or another time I say on a different line, let's do fingerings, but we'll still use hot cross buns. So they go one and two, one and three open, and they're actually pushing down the valve, so they get the whole sensory imaging. Uh, those are the kinds of things we'll do in this outline when I'm reviewing or teaching something new or whatever, but short little bits. And uh, then if time permits, if they went faster than I thought, and I don't fill in all these lines, I might have two in the review section and a couple in the new material, and maybe one in the if time kind of area but it's there. The other thing I want to point out is the contract, which is the other side of the paper. This is where uh, one of the things I'm, I'm doing is um, I'm exposing them to accountability. So not only do they sign this, but their parents sign it. And until they do, they don't bring an instrument home. And it's very specific. And it also has a double edge to the sword. It says, not only will they attend Wednesday things consistently and be courteous and all that kind of stuff, they will attend Sunday school faithfully each week at the Salvation Army. I'm not interested in teaching an instrument studies class for the neighborhood. They can go to school and do that. I've seen a lot of core programs where they have 100 kids coming in and out and doing all kinds of stuff, and they never darken the door of the Salvation Army ever after that. There's no connection. But I say, no, this is the band that gives me these free instruments is the one that expects me to train people to play in that band, and they play every Sunday. And that's why we start with the Sunday school requirement. It also says that, you know, the stuff about being, music being lost or damaged or the instrument, you have to pay for the repair, that kind of thing. Very, have very few problems with, with that kind of thing. Um, and be present to perform on special Sunday programs when scheduled two or three times between November and June. 
that's the other thing with beginners. You got to have an objective for them. They know that in December, we're going to play at the Christmas program. And I did a little piece and it's available free on the website. I think it's called uh, Christmas Debut. And it's for solo instruments and a quartet. You can play this thing uh, and it's free. You can get the PDF and it's uh, subtitled Good King, what's his name? And uh, there's there, they're also making muffins, I think, or Muffins Rhapsody is, uh, is also on that website. And so my kids, uh, they did, even in the land of COVID, we performed, we had to do it as a video, but they were there every Wednesday night, by the way, just distanced. And uh, we recorded them playing Good King, what's his name with uh, piano accompaniment. And uh, they did that. And then in the spring concert, they did uh, a solo that's in the middle of Standard of Excellence called Sawmill Creek. And the kids do that every year. And our kids this year figured it out. They said, everybody else has played this solo, haven't they? Yes, they have. So they'll know if we made a mistake. Yes, they will. And they just imputed it to themselves. They realized, man, we better get this right because everyone's going to be fingering along, you know, but that was the, that was the, the great incentive. So even with beginners, you want to create um, those performing uh, opportunities. But you can see that what I've done is I've established clear expectations. My outline makes it clear that I'm going to be consistent. Every week I'm going to be there, or my assistant, or somebody, or Tom, if I can't be there. But they're going to cover this lesson. These kids are going to be accountable. They know their test is going to come up. So that's basically uh, my take on, the, on how to start a beginner's program. And it's been really interesting to see these kids. Eventually, they'll move on to other instruments as they get bigger. And for those who wanted to study percussion, I said, like Steve Jordan, who, who plays in the staff band, he said, I'd like to play drums. I said, yeah, learn the notes now and then take percussion in school. And he got into percussion in seventh grade and he became a very good percussionist. And every now and then when we still need him, he can still sit down and play an E flat bass because he knows his fingerings, he knows how to play. And, uh, and he's a better percussionist because he learned all that and he can apply that to mallets. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>